In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever your time is. Welcome to The Sharpener. This is Derek Davis, the minister of this particular ministry. So we are in part five now of the Uncensored Scripture series. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying working on this. And I was looking at my stuff earlier for what I'm planning on this on the series, and I decided to do a few extra things, um, especially with the later part of the series. Is originally was supposed to be a 12-parter. Now it's turning into more of a 15-parter. And I am perfectly okay with that because that means that God gets to speak to me even more clearly on what he is trying to teach me through first, through third John and the letter Jude. Father God, Lord, I just thank you for this time that you've given me the words, the knowledge, and just to bring people into closer relationship with you. Lord, I pray that as people listen to this sermon, that they are spoken to directly. Lord, I just ask that you change lives. Amen. So you might have noticed the title of the sermon is called The World According to John. And this is taken from 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. The title, The World According to John, is actually a little play on words of a book written by John Irving. The original book was called The World According to Garb. Well, thinking about, you know, the theme of 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, if it's perfectly The World According to John. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So let's just do a few superficial observations of the verse. We see that John is commanding Christ's followers to not love the world or anything in the world. We also see if Christ's followers do love the world, that they can't love the Father. John also lists three things of the world, which are lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That stuff does not come from the Father. And when we look at those verses superficially, we see that there may have been an idol worship problem. And then finally, just the last superficial observation that we can pull from those couple of verses is that the will of God has a longer lifespan than the things of the world and the world itself. Let's dig into this a little bit more. And I'm going now into the Gospel of John in chapter 12, verse 31, where the writer tells us that Satan is a ruler of the world. And when I was reading that, I couldn't help but think of one of my favorite people in the history of the world, Watchman Nee, and he said this, Satan can only attack us from the inside in. He may work through the lust and sensations of the body or through the mind and emotion of the soul, for those two belong in the outward man. As we see throughout reading the Bible that there are multiple examples in the Old Testament about illustrating how people love the world. So I want us to take the time to learn from our Old Testament counterparts before we even move into modern day. So first we're going to start in the book of Amos. That's our first example. I call this particular part of this learning from our past, the Old Testament learning from our past. And there's a couple of things that I noted, especially in the book of Amos. One of them comes from chapter 2, verse 4. Judah rejected the law of the Lord, did not keep the Lord's decrees, and they were worshiping other gods. Another thing in the same chapter, in verses 6 to 8, we find that Israel takes advantage of people. They delve in the practice of incest, and they're gluttons. 
So some conclusions that we can make from it to wrap it around the verses that we read earlier in 1 John, that those that love the world ignore God and his commands. So that's the lust of flesh, end of the eyes. Those that love the world end up worshiping things in the world. That's the lust of flesh. Uh, A good example of that are Hollywood celebrities. Uh, Teenagers have these posters of Lady Gaga, of some other singer that's making poor choices in their life. Just the fact that they have a poster of that celebrity bothers me. Because that says, hey, I love this person. I love them to death. I worship them. And that's, to me, that's modern-day idol worship. So we get out of that, diet and exercise fads are another huge problem in modern society. It shows us that we are definitely lusting after our own flesh, that we, that the people that do the diet and exercise fads, they go to each one, to each one, to each one to try to improve themselves, and they don't recognize that the only way of improvement is seeking after Jesus, kind of really went on a little bit of a tirade there. I didn't mean to do that. But the other conclusion that we can get from the book of Amos is that those that love the world believe that they're the most important people. And I honestly blame the 1970s for this with the birth of the me generation. This me generation is all about I'm the only one that matters. So I'm going to change myself and continue to improve myself. And they leave Jesus out of it. That's what bothers me about the me generation is that you see a separation of Christ from the creation that he's made. And that creation is us. And that's a lust of pride that we see in that. Our next example comes from the book of something I can't even pronounce. So I'm just going to do my best to say it. Habakkuk. In chapter 2, we find an illustration that the people of the world are drunkards, they are arrogant, they do not rest, and they are greedy. That's found in verse 5 of chapter 2. So we have all three of the elements in 1 John being mentioned. The lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of pride. What we can, do, what we can get from that book that I'm not going to say again is that those that love the world are too focused on material things. So especially that focus is really on the lust of eyes. What we, what we see is what we want. What we want, eventually we end up getting it. And we're never satisfied with that sort of lust. In any sort of lust, we're never satisfied, actually. My third example comes from Ecclesiastes. And in wrapping up the Old Testament, we're going to answer the question, what does Solomon have to say all about this? And it's scattered all throughout this particular book, what he has to say. Essentially, it's wrapped up in one three-word sentence. Everything is meaningless. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Ecclesiastes. What are those meaningless things? Wisdom, that's in verse 18 of chapter 1. Pleasure, chapter 2, verse 1. Labor slash toil, that's chapter 2, verses 22 to 23. Advancement, chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. And then riches, chapter 5, verse 8 to 20. Granted, there were a few more examples than that, but I wanted to use those. So let's transition now into the New Testament, learning from our present. So as I just spoke a few seconds ago, the things that Solomon calls meaningless is what the world loves. Today, our world loves the latest philosophical trend, seeking out pleasures, being workaholics, and competing with their neighbors so that they can be more successful. In other words, keeping up with the Joneses. When I was looking at the transition between the Old and the New Testament regarding this particular subject about the world, as John defines it, I was reminded of what Leonard Ravenhill said. And he said this, Our God is a consuming fire. He consumes pride, lust, materialism, and other sin. Remember that when we're going through the New Testament. First of all, and most importantly, what does Jesus say about the world? He says a couple things. The first one that I want to talk about is Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It may sound familiar because I did talk about mastership a few weeks ago. Is that nobody can serve two masters. It's either one or the other. Jesus or this. Jesus or that. Choose Jesus. 
John 14, chapter, verse 15, says, If you love Jesus, that you will keep his commandments. That shows a separation from the world to Jesus. And then John chapter 15, verses 18 to 21, I'll read those. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before, before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute in me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they don't, because they don't know him who sent me. I'm just going to say this right now. This message is going to be really ridden with different scriptures from all over the place. And that was my intention. Because our definition the Christian definition of the world, can be found in all the scriptures that I have read and will read. So the things that Jesus said we see are pretty beneficial to us. We cannot possibly love Jesus if we're more focused on the latest philosophical trend, putting pleasure before Christ and constantly working. Again, nobody can serve two masters. It's Jesus or this, Jesus or that. When we serve Jesus, everything else is less important. Jesus is the reason for our worship. So let's take a look at some other parts of the New Testament. What, what do the disciples say about the world? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We've been studying Hebrews in our Monday night discipleship group, which we need to change the name of because we're no longer meeting on Mondays. We've been meeting on Wednesday nights instead of Mondays. So if you can think of any cool titles that we can call the small group, that'd be great. (laughs) But we were studying chapter 13 just last week. Chapter 13 is the last chapter of Hebrews, and we had a great time studying this. And one of the things that was brought up was verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Again, as I said earlier, Jesus is always with us. From the start to the end, he is always with us. In my personal Bible study time, I've lately been listening to 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. So when I was listening to that a few weeks ago, this verse stuck out at me. Abstain from every form of evil. As Christians, again, we cannot serve two masters. We can't serve Satan and serve Jesus at the same time. It's just not possible. We can't do that. So if we're going to trust in Jesus and recognize him as master of our lives, we need to abstain from what is evil. What is evil? The lust of the eyes, the lust of flesh, the lust of pride. Every sin kind of falls into one of those categories. So we need to abstain from those things so that we can draw closer to Jesus. And then a really long, long line of scripture that comes from the New Testament is from Ephesians Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person hmm, makes you think of the lust of the eyes, flesh, and pride there. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those 
who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. So that was quite a bit. Like I said, this is literally riddled with Scripture, this particular message here. So how does the, this whole topic of the world and its things relate to biblical inerrancy? How does it relate to biblical infallibility? We're going to look at one person that doesn't quite agree with the fact that the Scriptures are inerrant. This guy's name is Bart Ehrman, and I don't mean to speak death upon him when I dis- discuss what I found about him. Rather, I, wa- I want to share this so, we're, so that we're praying for this guy, that he recognizes the truth of Jesus and what the Scriptures truly do say. We want him, we want him to grasp the truth. We don't want to kill him and say a bunch of negative things about him, because that would be wrong of us to do that. We shouldn't be listening to it with false teachings, but yet we need to be praying for this guy. And it is okay to be to be aware, to be a little bit knowledgeable about these things, because it boosts our prayer language and it boosts our prayer life. And when we find that these false teachers are finally getting the truth, we rejoice. Before I begin um, explaining about Bart Ehrman. I have another quote from Watchman Nee. Many of the Lord's people currently commit the same error as did the saints at Corinth. The words of the Lord are spirit and life, but these people do not accept the words accordingly. They investigate theological problems with a very cold mind and search the hidden meaning of the Bible with the design of presenting the best interpretation. They satisfy their lust for knowledge. When I ran into that last statement, they satisfied their lust for knowledge. I was brought back to Ecclesiastes, and I went to chapter 1, verse 18. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I've always said that when we're, when we're being discerning about false teachers, about false prophets, is that be wary of those that, think, that say that they know it all that they walk with the air of, hey, I know everything. Don't trust so-and-so because he's got it wrong and I'm the only one that gets it right. Be wary of people like that because they're prideful. The lust of pride, as we saw in First John. That's what, they're, what I would like to call afflicted with, is this lust of pride. I don't know everything either. And I'll say, and I'll be honest And if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I'm not going to come up with something convoluted just to put myself up even higher. I will say that I don't know the answer, but I know where you can find the answer. I I try to do that. And actually, I think I'm pretty good at admitting when I don't know what's being asked. Another scripture verse in the New Testament that we can look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. 
Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, which is the image of God. So as we're going through this, keep in mind the Watchman Nee quote from a few seconds ago, and keep in mind Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18, as well as the verses that I just read out of 2 Corinthians. I got most of this of the information about Bart Ehrman from Norman Geisler's book, Defending Inerrancy. And then I also picked up a couple of his books to still leave through him and just to make sure that what I was reading out of Geisler is accurate from Ehrman's actual words. So let's look at four statements that Ehrman has said regarding inerrancy. Number one, the original manuscripts were not reliable and are non-existent. Number two, The transmission of manuscripts was unreliable. Statement number three. There have been significant changes in the manuscripts. And then finally, statement number four. These changes undermine the doctrine of inerrancy. If we are to stand by what Ehrman said regarding inerrancy, that means that we cannot trust the wisdom of Solomon, nor the wisdom of Jesus, nor the wisdom of Paul or of Peter pertaining to being separate from the world. I'm going to drive that home with that. If we are to believe what Ehrman says, that means Solomon, Solomon's wisdom n- never existed. What Jesus said regarding the world could have been misworded. Paul's teachings about sexual immorality is twisted. So if we believe what Bart Ehrman says, we disregard what the people in the New Testament and the Old Testament have said. Further, Ehrman distorts the word of God by claiming that the letters of John were transmitted incorrectly. Bart Ehrman continues to say that people need to approach the Bible with presuppositions. They shouldn't read the text through the eyes of faith, but as neutral scientific observers. The difficulty with that claim is that even Ehrman doesn't approach the text as a neutral scientific observer, but as one with presuppositions that are contrary to inerrancy. And the funny thing is, when we are reading the scriptures, we need to be reading them with our eyes on Jesus, on our faith in Christ. Christ comes alive in every book of the Bible. For example, Genesis, that's a creation story. We've got that. Then we've got First and Second Samuel talking about the life of David. And we see his actions, King David's actions, are actually typologies of what Christ has done after that. So we have... So Ehrman approaches this with a scientific presupposition, even though he just said, do not approach the Bible with presuppositions. Another thing that he, that he goes about is saying that the process of changing the text still occurs today. I slightly agree with that because we do have our presuppositions. Our presupposition needs to be our faith in Jesus. So every time a person reads the Bible, they're changing the meaning of the text to suit their own cultural and theological agenda. The implications of that view are very disastrous. For example, the homosexuality thing, there are, there are false teachers saying that you can be a gay Christian, and that's not right. That's, that's false. They're approaching that with the cultural aspect of what the decision was from the Supreme Court a few weeks ago. Just a couple of other conclusion things. One of them comes from Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. And it says that we're not to add or subtract from the word of God. In changing the textual meaning to suit our own cultural and theological agenda, 
in other words, the worldview that we've got, we run the risk of adding or subtracting from the word of God. You know, I'm reminded, I don't have this in front of me, but I'm reminded of a verse, I posted this on my Facebook, and it was talking about a millstone hung around the neck. We've had a lot of false teachers, a lot of false prophets throughout the course of history. So when they're saying things like, you can be a gay Christian, when they're saying things that are very contrary to what the Bible is saying, they might as well have a millstone around their neck. I hate the truth in that scripture, but it's there. So, just take the time, take the time to sit down with Jesus, sit down with the scriptures, and ask yourself, are there any false doctrines that I'm listening to? Am I stuck in this world of presupposition I'm looking at the Bible with different colored glasses. Think about that for a little bit. There's going to be no instrumental worship music because I want you to get alone with God on your own time. Thank you once again for listening to this. Thank you for listening to my rants a little bit. I admit I did rant a bit. And like I said, please don't trash Bert Ehrman. I tried not to trash him. And just be praying for him. So, as usual, be blessed. In the beginning was the Word.